Finnovate showcases cutting-edge banking and financial technology through a global conference series featuring short-form demos and thought leadership. Now, the conversation continues on the Finnovate podcast. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Finnovate podcast. Joining me today, we have David Whitcombs, VP of Product at MX. David, thanks so much for joining me. Hi, Greg. Thanks for having me. So we're going to talk about open banking, open finance a little bit. But before we get there, can you start by just introducing yourself, taking 60 seconds or so, and telling everybody what we need to know about MX? Sure. As you said, I'm a VP of Product at MX. I've been working in financial services for over 15 years now uh, with over two and a half years at MX, three years at Fiserv, and another 10 with a community financial institution. I've done anything from running a mortgage shop to coding online banking mobile applications to sales engineering, and now at MX to leading product development. But about MX, MX is a company that from its founding has been focused on empowering the world to be financially strong. And we're deeply invested in empowering open finance because we believe it is the only way that that mission can be accomplished. We're the only fintech that has put together market-leading and award-winning open banking connectivity, transactional data enhancement, and financial wellness experiences all under one roof, keeping users connected to their financial lives at thousands of fintechs and financial institutions in North America. And as a B2B2C business, we can help organizations keep their users connected to their finances with APIs or white-labeled solutions. So we have a wide range of delivery options as well. Cool. And I think anybody who's come to Finnovate obviously will be aware of MX. We've seen a lot of demos from yourselves over the years. And, and people who are interested, by the way, you can go back and watch them at finnovate.com slash uh, videos. You can find out how they've kind of grown over the years. But today, as we talked about, you know, we're here to talk about open finance and where there are opportunities coming for forward-thinking financial institutions. Before we jump in there, I'm just really curious. Let, let's start by getting a, a kind of definition in place. How do you at MX define open finance and the space around it? Yeah, so, so MX defines open finance as the ability to access and act on financial data to build personalized experiences which we think increases the pace of innovation and ultimately drives greater industry collaboration. And we think it's bigger than just bank accounts. And it's rapidly growing to investment accounts and insurance accounts. And we see other, other realms being brought in like payroll has been huge over the past year and a half. And it means that companies, whether they're financial services companies or not, can build and offer digital products that help consumers and businesses understand their financial lives. So that's a really interesting point about companies that aren't financial services. Can you expand on that a little bit? Sure. So one example we have in flight right now is we have a benefit provider who's seeking to understand the financial health of the employees of the companies they're serving. And so MX gets the opportunity to work with this provider and embed some of our products and services so that employers can understand how the how the the products they're pushing out and how the, the services they're giving to their employees are actually impacting them from a financial perspective, not just from the, the kind of social and emotional health angles that, that companies often address. So some of the other spaces are, um, you know, we think decisioning gets made more intelligent, whether that's account opening or lending or marketing. Uh, we think we're going to see new business models being discovered around uh, how you engage with your with your spending patterns, whether that's through rewards or payment for service, or things of that nature. Now, and we think financial wellness will take a broader part of everyday activities, not just be bound to a banking application. So we think there's a lot of places where open finance is going to drive new uh, new solutions. Yeah, certainly I'm in agreement with you on that one. Um, I think the the question becomes, you know, looking at the United States as a market, obviously open banking and open finance will look different in different geographies. Europe and Asia, for example, or you could make the case that there may be a little bit ahead of us in this area in the US. So, you know, what does open banking look like in the US market? I think first and foremost, it is market driven. If you talk to anyone in the US who's in the open banking and open finance space, we'll all say, it's, open, it's market driven. Um, companies like MX have created APIs. Those APIs have enabled the growth of the fintech industry in the US. And ultimately, I'd say increased competition that has better outcomes for consumers. I think one of the great benefits we've seen is the decrease of, of NSF fees and the penalties that, that consumers have faced for, ha for not being as financially well off as, as others in the economy. And so we've seen improvements and we've seen out better outcomes that way. Um, but so that's that's the first key point. It's market driven. 
And I think tying on to that, you know, while we're, I would say, behind in the in the formal approach and the regulatory approach of open banking, and that's allowed the, the UK and the EU to kind of accelerate ahead, especially in the payment space, what we're seeing in the US it has been, you know, at MX, we're seeing uh, advisors and investment companies start to have open banking APIs, or open finance APIs spin up faster than some banks. And so it's kind of an unexpected turn that the market has said, hey, investment data is really important. And we're seeing some of the biggest investment companies in the US say, we need to secure the APIs and secure the access so that the users of our services can access their data easily, efficiently, and securely. And so I think while we look at the UK and EU, they focus on the current account. The US has the advantage of being market driven, which means that what consumers are demanding is what's getting built, not just what the, the government's requiring. And so like, while, yes, like we're a little behind, I think there are some significant advantages that we have because we've had more use cases pop up a bit more broadly. No, that's a really interesting point. I mean, certainly they got a head start, but looking at where it came from, obviously as a result of this kind of top-down legislation, I think a lot of the financial institutions were maybe a little bit hesitant to engage initially. And then as the time went on, they sort of started seeing maybe some benefits for themselves, some market advantages for themselves. You know, um, you know, you talked a little bit about the CFPB and some of the changes coming there. I still think that from, you know, when you look at the U.S., to your point, it is going to be this kind of market driven side of things, which means in order for it to really catch on, it has to be because financial institutions are, are seeing benefits from it. Um, now, you, you kind of touched on a couple of these, but I just want to dive into that more broadly, because this is obviously a huge component to making open banking successful in the United States. Sort of what's in it for the financial institutions? What motivates them to come in and engage? Sure. I'm not going to dwell long on it, but we have to say regulation is one of the best incentives, but it's the stick, not the carrot. I think you've flirted with that with that concept already. Um, it. CFPB has said regulations coming. The OCC has already made some statements about banks and their and their uh, and their knowledge and exposure to aggregators. So there's a knowledge that it's there and something's coming. But ultimately, from a competitive advantage and strategic perspective, it, simply put, customers are demanding it. Customers have been de have been demanding access to their data for the past two to three decades. Quicken and QuickBooks wouldn't exist if that wasn't the case. Intuit as a company wouldn't exist if customers couldn't share their data. And so this is not a new problem, but it's but innovation and new technology has made it that much more urgent. I think as banks dig deeper into it, they'll realize that, yes, their customers want it. And they can't control all the experiences outside of their digital ecosystem. But what they can do is recognize that, yes, my customers are going to engage outside of my digital walls. And if they do, I want to make sure that that experience is the best experience possible when they do connect. So that's step one. Step two is, if they do connect outside of my ecosystem, where are they connecting? And this is where some of the strategy comes in. If I, as a CIO or CTO or chief marketing officer, know that my customers are connecting outside, and now I know where they're connecting, what are the patterns that we're seeing as they're connecting? Do 10, 20, or up to 30% of my users connect to a financial wellness app? Is it one specifically that's, that they're getting benefits from? If so, what's the benefit? And how are we either missing that as a financial institution or data provider? Uh, is there something we can do to either partner with that application? Or is it simply something they're going to go to regardless and we can't, we, we can't help? But if there is something we can, can identify that helps us differentiate or capture new business, it's really important for banks to understand or credit unions or financial institutions to understand. Um, so that's, that way it becomes strategic. As you stand up open banking and open finance APIs, the way you architect it is really, really important so that you understand the context of the user and understand where they're going and, and how your, your organization can benefit. That's a really um, interesting I point. I just want to interject really quickly because this idea of getting more information and kind of more understanding of your users, we, we talk about this from the, the standpoint of, you know, knowing what's going on in your users' lives, but looking at it from this other standpoint of what services are they getting outside of our walls is a really interesting one that I don't think I've heard mentioned before. So I just wanted to kind of jump in really quickly and, and highlight that as something which isn't necessarily talked about a lot when you look at this kind of, you know, what do you actually know? What kind of information do you get from this? That's a really key point. 
Yeah, and, and MX is also building some solutions that help help recognize that. But I, I do want to step back and say, as a as a financial institution, it, when you're looking at building an open finance API, again, look at what's out there and understand where the financial data exchange exists in the ecosystem, uh, because interoperability work, will turn into efficiency as you're kind of understanding the the, the ground and and how to navigate it. Because if you're if you find yourself coding up to two or three or four different uh, APIs to help get users connected, that's ultimately going to become inefficient and going to cost way too much to maintain. And so ensuring that you understand, again, what the outlook looks like, I would say, look at the financial data exchange, understand the interoperability they're providing and in their future site over open finance is, is just vital. Um, the, again, full disclosure, MX is on the board of, of the FDX. Uh, and so we're active participants in their ecosystem. And uh, but I highly recommend looking at what they're doing because it's really important. No, I think that's a really good piece as well. So certainly you know, there's a lot in it for the banks who engage. There's a lot to be done. And ultimately, I think you know, to your earlier point where you kind of came into this, the consumers are the ones who really benefit here with all of this. You get some increased competition, some uh, ideas that the banks will be more aware of what their consumers need. And obviously that's going to give banks some strategic advantages who engage early. It's going to create some new opportunities. But at the end of the day, it's really the consumers who win. And this is kind of why you see you know the CFPB getting involved because this is something which will make everyday people's lives better. So now I know that obviously you know we brought you on the call for a reason. You at MX are very aware of what's happening here. What are you guys doing from your side to prepare for this shift? You know, are, are you? I'm sure you're probably getting requests from customers to understand what the space is, uh, what's happening in the space. What else are you guys doing to um, you know, just be aware of this and, and to kind of push it forward yourselves? Sure. Uh, we're getting tons of requests to help engage and navigate the space. And so in preparation for this shift, we've done a few things. Say, first and foremost, we created a new product over the past year and a half. And it's called MX Access. It's a platform that's focused on helping data providers, which are typically financial institutions, control their data out, not just get data in. So this is about how the institution shares their data, not just about how MX helps them connect external accounts. It's about every one of our competitors as well. It's not just about MX's connection because we built it to be um, outside of our ecosystem, our, our aggregation ecosystem. So it's really seeking to be independent and neutral in the way it gives access. But the strongest part is it's, it's ensuring that consumers are securely connecting by removing credentials from the authentication flow of FinTech applications and keeping those credentials in the hands of the data provider. So we built tools in MX access to help FIs deploy that public FDX API and how I mentioned that, like where that comment about where where your users are connecting, we built the analytics tools to show financial institutions where their users are connecting when it's not inside their bank. What apps are they using? How frequently they're connecting? And what data is being shared? Those are things we've built. I think the second thing we're doing is we're being realistic. Uh, we understand that banks are increasingly adopting APIs as an access layer, but we also know that while some might be done in the next six months, it's going to take some others three to five years. And so we're not, we don't have all of our eggs in one basket. We have multiple ways of working and securing our connections in partnership with financial institutions and their providers. And so those, those different access layers are vital to having kind of a long-term stable success, both for MX and for all the organizations that we're working with. So third, we're, con we're continuing to expand our use cases. So payment enablement has continued to be an increasing use case for MX, where Consumers give the permission to share their account numbers and routing numbers so that they can make a connection. And whether it's funding an account, making a rent payment or a mortgage payment, uh, making a car payment, those are all things that MX are, are leaning into heavily. We're leaning into account opening and lending and in, lending insights and small business data and more. And at the same time, we're continuing to invest in our data science and analytics practices that keep our data quality higher than our peers. Uh, but finally, we're realizing that open finance is showing up in many unexpected places. And so we're starting to build tools differently so that we can power an increasing set of contexts and, and user experience services than we have historically. So it's really, MX is incredibly excited about the next five to 10 years because we think there's a lot we can do to help really bring the consumer to the center of the experience. 
Yeah, and you hit on a crucial point there at the end, which is, you know, the flexibility is going to be key. We don't know exactly how these things are going to play out. We know that giving ourselves options is going to be important. And obviously, the, the point here is to be responsive to what consumers want. So being able to be slightly elastic and able to you know, give that kind of conscious, intelligent response to it is going to be really important. Um, you've been super helpful by talking through all these pieces. And I'm going to re repay you by being actually really rude and giving you a ridiculously challenging <laughs> question for like the final two <laughs> minutes that we have here. Um, but let's zoom way out. You know, uh, Can you paint us a picture of what the future of finance looks like you know five or ten years from now and again I, you've got about two minutes i know this is a ridiculous thing to ask but i'm going to ask it anyway so i, I think in five years we'll see an FD, fdx apis as a standard kept by uh, hopefully 99 percent of data providers and and we'll see clear regulation ensuring that customers can securely share their data digitally i, th I think that has to happen um but i think in 10 years i think open finance is really just the tip of the iceberg and what happens to consumer permission data sharing I think we'll see the world open to Amazon letting me permission what the sharing of what I purchase on a daily basis or on a, on a weekly or monthly basis. My grocery store lets me do the same thing. And I have a broader permission ecosystem that really brings in both uh, increased data sets, but also increases financial inclusivity. Because one thing we just learned with an MX report is that American Indians, Alaska Native respondent or Alaskan Natives, Hispanic Latino uh, respondents to a survey we did, Asian Pacific Islanders, and, and African American course or respondents all actually use mobile or use applications at higher rates than white respondents. And so, in my mind, part of the growth we're going to see is this massive growth in inclusivity of financial applications and financial financial uh, advocacy for for users around the globe. So, I'm incredibly excited about that. No, it's true. There's a massive amount of work still to be done. There are huge numbers of people who are excluded right now. And I think, you know, looking at a platform like open banking, looking at some of the pieces that this enables, I think you're spot on that this is one of those ways that we can go out and get a lot of those people, bring them into the financial ecosystem, let them start to have some of the benefits that a lot of us kind of take for granted. Um, and, and obviously, you know, even those of us who are currently, you know, well served by our financial institutions, there's still room for improvement. I think this is going to be one of those really big game changers for us. So as they say, you know, watch this space. Um, it's going to be just fascinating to see it unfold. And, and well done to you guys at MX for you know, kind of helping to push this forward and, and being aware of where the opportunities lie. Um, I've been talking to David Whitcomb, VP of product at MX. David, thank you so much for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks again for having me, Greg. It was a pleasure. The Finnovate podcast is produced by Informa Connect in association with Provoke.fm Media. Check out Finnovate.com for information on Finnovate's upcoming shows and to learn how you can get involved. The discount code Finnovate Podcast will save you 20% on tickets to all of our events. And you can email us at info at for information on sponsoring, speaking, or demoing. Thanks for listening.